Hello, my good and faithful friends. It looks like we got 63 of you out there right at the moment. And that's a pretty good number to start with, considering I could be here all by myself. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I'd still talk. <laughs> I, I amuse myself more than I amuse anybody else. Uh, got a pretty, you know, wide variety of stuff today. This thing hanging right behind my head is part of it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're not going to really prove anything today, <laughs> in case you're wondering, based on the title. But um, we'll have a little fun with, with it anyway. I mean, Caleb and I, we decided that, you know, we fix stuff every day, all day long, and it's our turn to break stuff. <laughs> and we like breaking stuff. I do have uh, several miscellaneous things and even recommendations that I have for you today that have almost nothing to do with, uh, you know, the actual music part of the business, but you might find them helpful, interesting, and all that kind of good stuff, too. I've been, uh, if you can see the pencils in the margins here and stuff, I've been adding things to the uh, outline here as, as I type this morning. Um, we're going to just start off, might as well get going here, with a note from Bill Louvary. I think I, I just read this this morning, but uh, I highlighted a couple of points on here. You're not going to be able to see this really on your screen, but I'll read a couple of um, his points. Um, he says, I'm writing, writing to let you know about two channels I found on YouTube, and you might find them interesting. There is a channel called uh, Beto's Leather Work. That is awesome, and uh, he is into shoe repair and restoration, and, uh, and he, he is to that what you are to acoustic instrument repair and restoration. That's what he said. The other channel is called Precision Transmission, and the fellow is Richard, and he is a master transmission mechanic. Both guys remind me of you, <laughs> and, and then he goes on to say that we're all masters in our trades. Well, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. He goes on, you know, to be very complimentary, and he says he enjoys what we do, and he thinks that we've helped a lot, in the, and we appreciate that, and we, we really do. He says he's going to be moving back to the Kansas City area, and he might want to stop in. And I say, if you do, please feel free. Come on by, Bill. Um, let's see. The next thing that I have, I'm going to try to follow this, <laughs> sort of, kind of, but I'm just going to insert one of my uh, margin items here. Um, has nothing to do with really anything that we talk about here on the channel, but I just thought uh, it's kind of like a PSA. Uh, zero water. Do you know what that is? Zero water? It's a um, water filter system. I, one of the videos I watch, or one of the guys I watch on YouTube is uh, Project Farm. He tests everything. Well, I've been thinking about getting a water filter type deal for our well water. You know, our water is really good. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Most people that drink it can't even tell they're drinking well water. I mean, it seriously is tastes, you know, like it has no taste, which is one of the few well waters I've ever tasted that has really no taste. Um, so it's pretty good. But anyway, I've still been toying with the idea of putting a filter on it. We do have a filter through our refrigerator, and we mostly drink the water that's been filtered through the refrigerator. Well, zero water, uh, according to Project Farm, kind of outdoes all the others. And, um, you know, I trust this guy. He seems like he's pretty thorough and you know, not every test he does is 100% scientific and perfect and all that, but who is perfect, you know? Um, but anyway, he tested a whole bunch of water filters recently, and he, and he tested some really expensive ones, or at least I thought they were expensive. They were in the several hundred dollar range. And then zero water is like 30 bucks, you know, 40 bucks. And zero water just outdid them all, like, hands down. One of the really expensive ones got very close to zero water, but in my opinion, zero water just beat them. Um, and, the, and I would say zero water won hands down because they're so cheap and they had the best results. So here's my experience with it. I went ahead and ordered one and I ordered a couple extra filters. 
Um, so Zero Water comes with a water tester, by the way. And um, so I took the tester and I tested my tap water straight out of the tap. Um, you know, my well water, that is. And it was over 600 parts per million, which doesn't surprise me because I would think there would be, you know, quite a bit of uh, dissolved solids in uh, well water. I mean, that's kind of expected. Uh, you're going to have all kinds of ground minerals, etc. And who knows what else? And I don't really want to know. <laughs> so anyway, um, then I tested it as it went through my uh, refrigerator filter and that dropped it down into the 400 parts per million. So it, it improved it by a couple of hundred parts per million. Then I filtered water uh, straight from the tap through the zero uh, water filter and it went down to zero parts per million. And so that's pretty good proof. But still, the skeptic in me goes, hmm, you know, there's still a way they could kind of fudge that result, you know. They could do something to that filter that makes it react to the meter that you're using, you know. I mean, it could be tied like that, you know. And I, so I'm, I'm still skeptical. So I thought, well, I took a bottled water, uh, you know. I, I thought, well, bottle, bottled water will probably still have some parts per million or something, you know. So I tested that. Believe it or not, it was zero parts per million. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm pretty sure the zero water filter is legit. And it's cheap. So I'm just telling you that in case you want, you know, to really clean up your water. And super cheap way to do it. And it's just apparently as good as bottled water. Now, that's my opinion. I am no scientist, no expert. You can have your own opinion, but I just thought I'd tell you that because it's incredibly cheap. I mean, like I bought three ex I mean, two extra filters and the whole uh, container, the whole thing. I bought the 30 cup one, by the way. Uh, and the whole thing was like 70 bucks. So, I mean, that's pretty dang cheap. So, you know, I kind of thought it might be one of those deals where it's like the printers these days. And by the way, I'm going to talk about that too. Uh, you know, like they sell you the printer dirt cheap and then the ink is like gazillions of dollars. Well, I thought it might be like that, but it's not. So anyway, zero water, check it out if you're interested in uh, purifying your water at home or anywhere, I guess. Um, let's see. The next thing I want to just mention is Mountain View real quick. Uh, we'll be down there October 14th through the 17th, that's Mountain View, Arkansas. If you don't know what that is, it's just a town based on people playing music and jamming and stuff just out in the open. So people just kind of go on any corner or any place and get together and play music. So you can find lots of people just sitting out in the open air, just sitting around playing music. And we'll be down there October 14th through the 17th. And you can generally find us under the, I call them pavilions, but they're really gazebos. Under the gazebos, which would be, if you're facing the courthouse, to the left back corner, that direction. And we're sometimes on the porch of the uh, Wildflower Bed and Breakfast, which if you're facing the courthouse would be on the back right corner. Anyway, October 14th through 17th, come down there if you can and we'll have some fun. I have a short build video. This sort of has nothing to do with anything I normally do either, <laughs> but I just thought you might find it entertaining. Um, I, I am going to, I don't even know if I want to give you a clue because I don't really tell you what I'm building here until the very end. <laughs> so I think I'll just let you watch it. Here we go.
there you go. It was a remote control holder. <laughs> Some of you might find that helpful. Um, you know, there's so many remotes these days. And, you know, my new uh, media room, man cave, home theater, whatever you want to call it, my new recording studio, all of that stuff, uh, lots of things in there have remotes. And so it was just handy to have a little holder there that you could just screw onto the back of a coffee table or something like that and uh, it holds them very well. Um, I just CA glued it all together. Uh, it's plenty strong for that purpose. Uh, I made another, and the reason I know that is because I made another one several years ago and used it for many years and never had any trouble with it. So anyway, there you go. Just thought I'd show that to you. Um, <clears throat> Eric Carlson sent me an email. So here's, a, here's another quick email, and then I'll read you a few points off of it. Um, Eric says, uh, all I can say is, wow. And I mean, wow. <laughs> I purchased a saddle from you a month or so ago, and I finally got around to putting it on my Kentucky mandolin. Um, he says, your videos do it no justice at all. I'm telling you. <laughs> Back to the saddle, or he's, he goes on and then he goes back to the saddle. It's dramatically increasing sustain, a lot, much nicer balanced tone. Um, you know, it projects much better. It's loud, but balanced. And he says, this is from a fan in, north of you in Minnesota. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it very much. You know, I told Eric, I said, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the truth. I, I hate to brag on them that big, and that's the truth because not every single person has that reaction. Um, you know, I mean, most people do, I think, more than half at least. But I've had one or two people just say they didn't like them, you know. But I have to also tell you at least one of those that I can even remember. I, I can't even remember the other one. But the, the, he's super, 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 super traditionalist, and he ain't going to put nothing on there that Bill Monroe didn't use. You know what I mean? That's pretty much the bottom line of it. And um, the other, I did surprise myself because I had a, another friend that's local here that plays mandolin, and he actually brings his mandolin here for me to change the strings on it. He, he'd rather have me do it, you know, so I do that. And one day I said to him, I said, uh, have you ever thought about trying one of these antler saddles? And he goes, what's that do? You know, and he's a real traditionalist. And so I put it on there and he loves it. He just uses it all the time and he, he doesn't want it to go back. So that's all I can tell you for sure on it. Um, I, you know, I don't brag on them too much. The only two absolute things I tell you for sure is that it will increase your volume. And uh, if you break strings... I guarantee you it will stop that if you're breaking them at your saddle. It, it just doesn't, you just don't break strings there. I'm a string breaking dude. I'm seriously telling you, if I put wood on there, I break two, three, four strings in an evening. I, I'm not kidding you. I break them like crazy. I put this on there and I won't even break one string in a month. It's just, it's that seriously different for me. Okay, enough on that. Um... Let's see, uh, that was Eric Carlson. Okay, we have a little short clip here, or not a uh, clip, but just another, like another public service announcement. This is on a music store up in the, near the Kansas City area, and it's uh, butlermusic.com up in Harrisonville, Missouri. I have no connection to them whatsoever. Uh, as a matter of fact, this kind of came via Caleb. Uh, somebody Caleb knows sent him this text. And I said, you know, I ought to just show this here because it might help somebody out here and help that music store out too. I take my hat off to these music stores because, uh, man, with all the online sales these days, how they even stay in business, I don't know. So if you're looking for violins of any form, I would get a hold of these folks because they got stiffed. They, uh, one of the music um, programs at one of the schools backed out on, on them on a large order. So they got stuck with a whole bunch of violins and things and cellos and violas and etc. So if you're looking for anything in that line, or if you know schools or anybody else that want them in quantity, maybe get a hold of these people here, Butler Music in Harrisonville, Missouri. 
Um, they're trying to sell them cheap uh, to, you know, to get out from under their cost, if you understand. You know, being in business, it's tough. And especially when you get stiffed like this and you're just stuck holding the bag. Um, so, I, uh, I'm going to move on from that. You can always come back and watch this video again later and pause it there if you need to look at that whole thing. Okay, that's my public service good deed for the day. Uh, well, actually, I had two of them so far because I told you about the water filter. And I'm going to tell you about one more thing, public service uh, wise. You know, printers are just the biggest ripoff in the whole planet. I mean, they really are. They're just, it, it's, it's even a bigger ripoff than most people realize. Um, the, those little tiny ink cartridges that they give you with the thing, I seriously am not exaggerating. They don't even have a teaspoonful of ink in them. Not even a teaspoonful. It's just a few drops of ink. That's all you get. And they're charging you 38, 40 bucks for those things. It's just huge ripoff. They sell you the printer so cheap that you know you you think well this is a great deal and you buy the printer and then the ink that comes with it lasts about three sheets of paper and then you have to go buy their ink at thirty eight dollars a cartridge and then those only last maybe a hundred pages or two hundred pages they don't last long that's for sure well here's a alternative now I'm not I don't even know what I paid for this I bought it a year or two ago um, it's a uh, well, I was going to write the number down. Uh, Caleb, would you go get the number off that printer? I'm sorry. I thought I wrote it down, but I don't see it here. Uh, it's a 4700 um, Epson. I know that it's a 47 series. It takes this kind of ink. It's uh, a huge difference. A huge difference. Um, it, you know, you get this big bottle of ink, and you, pour, and you actually pour it into a reservoir. 4762? 4760. 4760? Okay, it's mine is an uh, Epson 4760. I think it's ET 4760. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can look that up. I'm not saying that's the one you got to go with, but if you find one that takes this kind of ink, this is way cheaper. I mean, this, all of this ink, and this thing's full. And, and then you get the, you know, three more colored ones that are full. Way cheaper than those little tiny stupid things that have nothing in them. Um, yeah, so this is way to go. I'm, yeah, I can't even tell you. It's not even comparable. It's that much better. So if you're doing a lot of printing or you wish you could do a lot of printing, this is the way to go. It's by far cheaper. Now, you might pay more for the printer. Don't get me wrong. It, I think the printer's not a giveaway. It's more of a slightly more professional type printer, but I would use it in my house. I think it's perfect. Okay, um, there you go, public service number three. Um, I think that brings us to our <laughs> break demo. <laughs> We're just going to have fun with this. Lots and lots and lots of people said, have you seen the video on the in-glue, uh, in-grain gluing, you know? And that's why I put that little caveat in the front of that last video that I put out where I was fixing that neck. And I made the comment in there that gluing in-grain is not really the best option. And it really isn't. I, I still stand by that. Yes, I saw the man's video. Yes, I agree with every single thing he did. Believe it or not, I do. I there's not one thing in his video that I would disagree with. But having said that, I still don't think it's practical. Um, I don't think it's practical from the standpoint of your normal use, and I don't think it's practical from the standpoint of scaling it up. And you might say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, for instance, let's say you were making a dining room table out of walnut, you know, and you got all those long, you know, first of all, they're slab cut. They're not quarter sawn most of the time. So you got slab cut boards going down through there. You glued them on edge. We know the glue is very strong and it ain't going to break. You know, the, the wood usually will break before the glue. Okay. But when you got a slab sawn piece 
Uh, they don't typically break too much either. Uh, you know, that's pretty dang strong wood that way. So probably the glue joint would break on a slab sawn edge to edge. Now, if it was quarter sawn edge to edge, it will break on the grain line. There's no question. So his, all of his experiments were right, but they don't tell the whole story, at least in my opinion. You know, uh, you know I, I, I'm not disputing anything he did. I agree with everything he did. Um, and so the other, op the other thing about gluing up that tabletop is it's not practical. It doesn't scale up to glue all the boards end to end down the length of the table. Nobody would do that. And if you did do that and you stood in the middle of the table, where do you think it's going to break? It's going to break on that glue joint. Yeah, the, it's very strong. Uh, but it's not stronger than the wood and it's going to break, you know, and when you glue them this way, um, you know, it's, first of all, it doesn't soak into the end grain like it does the other way. And I, and, and if it's not quarter sawn, I'm pretty darn sure you'll break the glue joint before you break the board because it's not quarter sawn. That's the difference. If you noticed in his video, when he glued the uh, end grains, of course, it didn't break. Uh, it, it broke at the glue. When he glued them side by side, it broke down the quarter saw and, uh, grain lines. So that's my, you know, that's my caveat about it. It's I don't disagree with him. I would have, I could have even told you what those results were going to be before he did it. I, I absolutely, 100% would have known what was going to happen on every one of his scenarios. And I'm not trying to say I'm smarter than anybody else. I've just done a lot of gluing. <laughs> so. Caleb and I put together our own experiment that does sort of scale up. We don't even know. We haven't, we honestly, and I cross my heart, I promise you, we have not tested this. We don't know what we're going to see here. But we kind of think we know what we're going to see, but we don't know. So we're just doing this for fun. And we're not proving anything. We know that already. So just pay attention here and we'll just have some fun with this. First of all, I've just got a scale here. Now this scale only goes to 110 pounds, so we may not prove anything because we may not get it to work, you know. I just, first of all, I do have a, yeah, I wouldn't even call this quarter sawn. It's kind of, it's kind of on a 45 sawn piece of spruce. It's almost quarter sawn. Quarter sawn would be, the grain would be perfectly perpendicular. This is yeah, almost perpendicular, but it's not. It, it, it does kind of come through at an angle like that. So this is approximately the size piece of wood that we're going to try to break. Um, we're going to hook it on here. I've got Caleb standing by to watch the scale. I know you can't really see the scale very well, but I'm hoping that Caleb will be able to tell when this, you know, how much we're pulling and when it, if it breaks and when it breaks. <laughs> And I'm going to get my safety glasses on here. I've got them here. I want to do that first. Whoops. All right, so here we go. Let's see what happens. Now, this is spruce, okay? All right, we're at 110 pounds. That's the maximum of the scale. So it did not break. That's just a piece of wood. Okay. I think he was using spruce in his test, but I'm not really sure about that. I can't remember. Um, so that didn't prove too much, except that spruce is pretty darn strong. Quarters, you know, semi-quarter sawn, and I don't know if you can see the way the grain runs in that or not. But anyway, so now, oh no. <laughs> I have to I have to CA glue my tester back here. <laughs> When you know, my little test block here broke. It doesn't really have any stress on this, so it doesn't matter. I can glue it back. This is just to help hold my uh, clamp better. Okay, so now, now we've got a piece of mahogany. Now, th the reason we're using mahogany is because this simulates a guitar neck. That's what we're trying to scale up to, to some degree, but it's still a very rough test. Now, this is not quarter sawn, and with mahogany, it's pretty hard to tell how it's sawn to be perfectly truthful, but it, I would not call this quarter sawn. 
Okay, so let's see if we can get the clamps on this. Tighten that down for me there, dude. If you can get it on there. Yeah, go ahead and ah, tighten that down. All right. And let me try to do this better here. Here we go. All right, so now we've got the, this is mahogany. And I, you know, my guess is this is about the same size as that piece of spruce. My thought is that mahogany is not as strong. My thought is, and I don't know this because we have not tested it, but my thought is this might break. Um, but, you know, it might not. It may be stronger for all I know. You know, mahogany is considered a hardwood. Spruce is not. So here we go. It may not break either. No, it didn't break either. Okay. Like I said, we may not prove anything. <laughs> okay. Let's now we've got some other examples here. Now the other examples are different. Now we've got, here's a end-to-end um, -end piece of uh, mahogany that is rough sawn, meaning that I just sawed it with a saw, stuck it back together. This one is uh, a lap joint or a scarf joint. It's more like a scarf joint, I guess is what you'd really call it. And then another end-to-end -end that's rough. So we got two of the rough ones in case you know, one of them breaks really easy or something. Then we'll have another one to test. And then here's another end-to-end -end just like that, except that it's uh, sanded. I sanded the end smooth, which I think he sanded his on that video. But I'm not 100% sure of that based on what I could see. So let's, um, we'll start with one of the rough ones first. This is just my block came loose yet again. I don't know if it's the same side. I think it's a different side. Uh, where did my accelerator go here? Okay, so let's put this on here. I have a feeling this is going to break because it's a joint. So we know the wood itself is pretty strong, 110 pounds worth anyway. I kind of predict this is going to break much sooner than 110 pounds, but I don't know that for sure. Okay, this is rough sawed and glued with tight bond. Um, which, which tight bond did I use? I think I just used the right regular on. tight bond. Yes. Pretty sure I did, yep. Because I do have three in the shop, but I, I use regular tight bond. Okay. My thought is this is going to break, but I don't know that for sure. So here we go. Oh, i got to get it in here. Set. There it is. Okay, so here we go. 30, 40, 60, 70. I'd say you were about 70, maybe a high end of that. Okay. And I'm getting a Charlie horse in my leg. That's not always good. Okay, so it did break, and it broke cleanly at the joint, and it broke around 70 pounds. Now, that's rough saw. I think the sanding will make... Oh, it also broke the wood. Look at that. And that probably broke when it pulled through there. Um, anyway. <clears throat> okay, so let's try... Let's try another rough one, and just to see if we get this, a similar result. <clears throat> so we know that the solid wood is way stronger, because we didn't break it even at 110. And yet it broke at about 70 on the, on the rough glue joint. Okay, here's another rough glue. This is another rough sawn glue joint. The reason I wanted to use rough sawn, by the way, 
is because when a neck breaks, it's always rough, you know. And, of course, it's even better. Um, most of the time when those things break like that, they break on a long grain, you know, so you can glue it back together. you got a big surface. It should be very strong on most of those. A few times they almost break end to end like this. Very rarely do you see that. In my very last video, that guitar did break almost straight across. The reason I couldn't just glue that was it had already been glued with epoxy, which is not very strong that way. It's not very strong that way at all. But anyway, uh, so let's see here. Here's another uh, rough sawn glued on the end. So let's see where it breaks. Watch, Caleb. Just over 70. Just over 70 again, he said. Okay. All right. Well, so far it's going well because I haven't pulled the uh, ceiling down yet. <laughs> And my little jig here keeps coming apart. But it's... Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing. Now, this was sanded. So my guess is, and it's just a guess again. I don't know nothing about this. I would say that because I sanded it, this will be a little bit stronger. But that's just a guess. It might, in fact, prove exactly opposite. It might actually be weaker, for all I know. Okay. All right, I think I got it there. All right, so again, this one's sanded, so let's see if it holds up. Well, it broke. It broke. Before. You were almost to 70. But you yeah, it broke. It actually broke quicker, so we didn't quite make it to 70 on that. So that kind of surprises me a little bit. And then again, I, the other reason I was, wasn't was sure what to expect was because because those other ones are rougher, the glue can get back in there a little bit more, you know, and maybe that helps, you know. But anyway, the point is that one, for whatever reason, didn't work all that long. Now, here we have a small scarf joint. Now, it's not that much different than it just a straight in glue because it's only a straight 45 if it was a lot longer that would i think be even stronger but my suspicion is this one you know might hold together it might not break but i i expect it to at least hold up to about 80 90 anyway just because it's a little longer joint um, not because it's done real well because it isn't done real well. If it was a longer scarf joint, that would make a lot of difference. All right, so here we'll try the scarf joint here to see what that does. Trying to get it centered right on the joint. Okay, Caleb, you watching? Yeah. 40, 50, 60, 70, 70 80, 80, 90. There's 100. You were almost at 110. We were almost to 110, he said. So there you go. We didn't prove anything. We knew we wouldn't prove anything. That wasn't really the point. We just wanted to break something. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you understand where I'm coming from on that. I, you know, I, I didn't mean to try to pick the guy apart because I think he's 100% correct. In fact, I would have predicted every single result he got. Um, and I'm not saying it to try to make it sound like I'm really smart. 
I just been there, done this a lot, <laughs> you know, and uh, I've had those same experiences. But like I said, I don't think his test scaled up very well. When you got a three inch square block, basically is what he had, and you just, you know, you glue that together, that doesn't scale up all that well. What do you glue that's like that? <laughs> you know, it doesn't scale up very well. So that's why I think when you're talking about ingrain, for the most part, you're talking about a longer joint. Even if it's just a lap joint from a picture frame or, you know, or, or the thing going around a table or whatever, ingrain to, to that, I don't think is quite as strong as some other type of a joint. You know, I would, if, if you needed strength, I wouldn't rely on end-to-end -end too much if you really need strength and you need it to last a long time and be durable. That's all I'm saying. So I just don't think it's scaled up all that well. Um, but I do agree with every bit of his results. And, and, and it was eye-opening, don't get me wrong. I mean, it, it does, he did make a good point. Um, and I understand his point. So there you go. I don't know if that's what people were expecting me to say about that or not. <laughs> but that's the way I feel about it. Okay. Uh, Let's see here. Do it, did I miss anything yet? I don't think so. And I still have my eyes. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure how that was going to break, to be honest with you. I wasn't sure if anything was going to break on that scale, because that scale is not that, that strong. Um, we were going to talk about uh, binding and purfling and that sort of thing today. And I'm going to tie that in to the status of the last hurrah guitar because I think that's kind of what inspired it. And I thought this might be some good information for some of you. Um, let me get my wreckage, wreckage out of the way. <laughs> I kind of laid it in my way here. Okay. Well, first of all, the status of the last hurrah guitar is changed quite a bit. You can see the necks in it. And you can probably see that I, hopefully, I know this camera doesn't focus all that well on this stuff, but you can probably see I have, you know, that extra purfling in here, and it, it also travels down. I can't reach around there, but it travels down around the neck here. Maybe it'll focus. It's, I don't know, it's not really focusing on that very well. But anyway, it travels around there. It travels down the ends here. Now, why did I want to use this as a subject for today? Well, you know, in this particular guitar, I had only this length wood. I mean, this log that I had up here was... I think, I don't remember what I need now for, I think I need 30 inches or something and it was only 28 inches or something like that. But it was a couple of inches short, you know? And you're thinking, well, how can I use that for a guitar side if it's short? I mean, typically you need what you need, you know? Well, that's all I had of this rosewood was what came in this little log form. And yet this particular customer wanted me to use rosewood and you know, I'm not about uh, wasting anything. So I thought, I, I asked them, I said, well, what about this? Does this look good enough to you? And they go, yeah, that looks real nice. And so I saw it out using the AccuSlice system, I might add. And if you don't know what AccuSlice is, check that out on YouTube. John Manura, M-A-N-U-R-A. And if you go there and you make a comment or something, tell him Jerry sent you. Uh, but anyway, I used his AccuSlice system to saw that rough log into, um, you know, long pieces for these sides. But you can't stretch them, even with the AccuSlice system. They're only as long as they are. So I started planning out how I could, you know, do in trim here. So in other words, this board more or less stopped right there. <laughs> This board more or less stopped about where you see it here. One of them actually was already cut on the angle. And uh, I had to true it up a little bit, but I mean, it was you know pretty much on an angle already. So I just put in a, a wooden plate here and brought the sides up to that wooden plate. That's really what it amounts to. 
So by using purfling, binding, and trim, you know, I did stretch my boards. You know, I wanted to make it look like a feature rather than a problem. And I think you can say that I did that. I, you know, I'm not trying to brag on it, but I do think that's the way it looks. It looks like I did it on purpose, uh, you know, and, and pre-planned it that way to make it look good, you know. And uh, the truth of it is, I just didn't have enough material. But so my, I guess my point about this this morning is that you can use binding and trim like that to creatively fix things that are problems on instruments and or to make them look cool even when maybe it was a broken part or something. You know what I'm saying? So you need to think outside the box sometimes on this stuff. So um, what I wanted it to look like uh, just from a distance, I wanted it to look like that the trim, you know, the same trim going around here was going down the neck. That's kind of what I wanted it to look like. Now in the back, I'll just show you some more detail. In the back, I actually, if you want to call it 45, these angles here and, and made a 90 and, and a return and come down like this on both all the way around this. And again, it's all backwards to me. I can't tell what I'm pointing at. And on the front here, I didn't do that. And the reason is, um, to be truthful, I had already installed this binding all the way around and I hadn't thought it out thoroughly uh, about how I was going to return it here. And had I thought it out thoroughly, I probably would have stopped this purfling, this inside purfling here, I probably would have stopped it at the white and then returned it around. But I didn't. I went all the way through and I'd already done that. So I couldn't undo it very well. And uh, anyway, the point is here, I just butt jointed them. So you can see that. And I think that looks fine on this end. Now I haven't trimmed this smooth yet, by the way. This is still standing up proud. It's, it's tall. I, I only did this yesterday. Um, but uh, anyway, the point is that, uh, you know, I didn't make this end match this end but I don't think it needs to because of the neck and all of the other things going on up here. And I think it looks just fine. So the point is you can be all kinds of creative with bindings and uh, purflings. Now what's the difference between binding and purfling? Well, I can only give you my definition on that because I haven't looked it up to be specific. But the way I think of it is purfling is anything on the inside or inner parameter, inner perimeter, I guess is the better way, the inner perimeter or inside uh, of the wood. The binding is the stuff that's right around the outside edge protecting. Purfling is things more like this here. Now these, you know, you can call these a lot of things, decorative strips or whatever. But I, for the most part, purfling is the stuff that's on the inside of your binding area. And um, so like this is purfling around here, these round rings. And then of course the rosette itself is uh, where you put a whole bunch of blocks of wood together and make a rosette. That's really what a rosette is. Um, now, <clears throat> I wanted to go a little bit deeper into binding and purfling. You've heard me talk about this already in a lot of videos. Binding um, these days, at least for me, leaves a lot to be desired. I, and I guess I started early enough in this that I was used to using that old binding, the old plastic binding, that glued up really well, bent really well, and was awesome stuff. You can't really get that too easily anymore. You can still get it, but boy, you got to pay through the nose. You got to pay hazmat fees. You got to pay all kinds of crud. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. So most of the binding you get these days, that plastic binding I'm referring to, of course, is PVC based or some something like that based. It's not the old what I call celluloid based or. Um, uh, there's another word I used to that anyway that the old plastics would melt with like say model airplane glue That's basically what you use to glue them together with 
Well, the new PVC type plastics, they don't melt with that stuff. The reason the melting was an advantage is when you took those old plastics and you pushed them together, um, you could melt the, you know, put glue on both ends and they would melt together and make pretty much a seamless joint. You couldn't even really tell where one stopped and one started, you know, um, which was kind of a neat advantage. The, the modern plastic bindings kind of don't do that very well. And I, I did want to tell you about, in case you still are using the modern plastic bindings, which, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not really trying to run those things down. They just aren't fun anymore, in my opinion, because I'm so used to, I was so used to the old stuff. But if you are using the new stuff, then I would recommend highly that you use a different kind of glue these days. <clears throat> I would recommend that you use um, this canopy glue. Uh, it, it's kind of counterintuitive because this kind of glue looks like white glue, kind of, and you wouldn't think it would glue plastic really well, but that's what this is specifically intended for. They glue the plastic canopies on model airplanes with this. And they're, so in other words, they're gluing plastic to wood. Well, what are you doing when you're gluing plastic binding? Obviously, you're gluing it to wood. So this stuff really does work well. It holds really well. Uh, it's water cleanup. Uh, this is Formula 560 Canopy Glue. This says ZAP on it, Z-A-P. So I would recommend this with the new modern plastics. It, it works really well. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about today, about the um, bindings and things, is that uh, I've kind of sworn off the plastics, just because, of, mainly because of that. But then in another way, it was kind of, you know, I, I was looking for an alternative and then I hit on wood and I went, man, I wish I'd have been using wood all along. <laughs> I really like wood binding much better. I think it looks more rich. I think it's just beautiful. It does its job and you can, you know, you can really run into some problems with wood binding because if you, especially if you try to use curly maple like I did on this guitar, you know, you just look at it wrong and it wants to break on you. <laughs> I mean, seriously, when you try to bend that stuff with that, all that extra curl in it, it just wants to break and it, it just, it's kind of its nature is to break. <laughs> so, you know, you got to be really careful if you're bending the highly figured stuff. But now, I, I will just tell you um, some things I've noticed. If you get plain sawn maple, that bends pretty easily. If you get sycamore, which if you quarter saw your sycamore, um, sycamore doesn't dry well. I'll just tell you that right up front. When you saw sycamore down and you cut it up, it, it it's really difficult to dry well. It wants to twist and kink and all that. But if after you get sycamore dry, it's very stable. And if you saw it in a quarter sawn fashion, it makes beautiful binding because it's got little checkering all through it. It just is just gorgeous binding. And sycamore bends like butter compared to some of the other woods. So it's beautiful binding. Um, some other woods that would work good for binding are like walnut. It bends pretty well, um, you know, so you can, you, you can probably find almost any plain sawn wood and work it pretty well for binding. Now, on a um, mandolin, for instance, where you're going around that real tight scroll, yeah, good luck with almost anything you try that with. Uh, I have done it with the uh, sycamore and been fairly successful with the sycamore. I don't think I've done it with curly maple yet. I don't think I have. I'm trying to remember. But I can tell you, curly maple would be really difficult around that really small area of the scroll on a F-style mandolin. I know that for sure. That would be really tough. You would want to go really thin on your on your maple if you're going to do that, if you're even going to do attempt that. Uh, so that that's kind of a, a synopsis of it, of what I wanted to talk about on binding and um, purfling. Um, the only other thing I would say is that I started making my own purflings, which, you know, and bindings, which is kind of difficult in one way and it's not that bad in another way. Um, you know, in order to really make laminated bindings, what you start off with is, you know, you get whatever length you want 
and you saw them very thin. Um, you know, and when I say thin, like maybe the outer piece of the binding might be 60 thousandths, then you have an inner dark stripe, maybe a walnut or some other dark wood, and you would probably make that about 20 thousandths, and then the inside trim would be the white again, and that would be another 20 thousandths, and those are just rough numbers, so you end up with about 100 thousandths thick binding. Um, and then, but you want to maybe, maybe you want to, cut them in strips this wide uh, and only the 60 thousandths and 20 thousandths thin and whatever length you need. And then you laminate that all together as a sandwich and then you saw that whole thing through your bandsaw and that's how you make your laminated bindings then. Um, and when you do that, the glue I would recommend for that at this point would be Tight Bond 3. It's waterproof and it seems very flexible and very strong. I have not had one single piece since I started using Tight Bond 3 come loose. It has held every time, even on the tightest bends. So that's really good glue for that. It works really well. I know that from experience. Uh, there may be other glues that would even work better, but that's what I'm. That's what I know. You know. Um, then, like on doing things like this, where you get more detailed into this purfling. You basically do the exact same thing I just told you. You, you. you glue up sheets. The difference is that you cut those sheets on 45s or some other angle you like. 60 degrees would even be nice. Uh, makes it a really, really sharp, you know, uh, angle. Um, but anyway, the point is you, you, you just 45 all that and then you flip the patterns and you put them together in arrow form. And so really what you'd end up with, this looks like it was you know, one little thing, but basically it's a, it's a tall strip about this tall. And then you saw these through your uh, saw. So it, it's not as hard to do as it looks like it is to do. It looks like you're making into little individual tiny pieces. And really what you're doing is you are uh, making slabs, sawing them on 45, gluing them back together, but you're flipping them so they make an arrow. Um, I hope that makes sense to you. It's not as tough as it looks. So I would encourage you to experiment with it. Just, you know, do it on a small scale and just take some small pieces of wood and, and monkey with it, you know, and, and then you'll kind of get a feeling of what it's going to be like and you can do it on a bigger scale. Um, again, I would recommend highly uh, the AccuSlice system. I, you don't have to use that. I will just be honest and you don't have to use it. But the AccuSlice does a real good job on keeping things, you know, where you don't have much waste in your wood, especially if you're spending big bucks on your wood. Uh, if you're just using plain salt maple or, you know, walnut or something, that's not that expensive. But, you know, if you're using some exotic and you really want to get the most out of it, I tell you for sure, your active slice will get you the most out of it. Then the next critical tool for me personally, and, and I, both of these tools were given to me, so it's easy for me to just say you need these, okay? Uh, you know, I just want to be full disclosure. So that AccuSlice, I did not have to pay for it. It's an expensive machine, but if you do this a lot, it's way worth it. The same way with uh, the vacuum pressing system. The vacuum press, you know, they cost a few bucks. But man, there's nothing better for gluing flat pieces of laminate together. And I don't care what shape they are, uh, whether they're wide or, you know, thin strips or whatever. But if you're gluing anything that's flat together and you just want to clamp it, that vacuum pressing system, and that's vacuum pressing systems which um, sent me that uh, uh, vacuum bag and the whole thing, and it's a little vacuum pump and it sucks the air out and boy, it just laminates that stuff together. Now you can make yourself a glue up jig for your bindings and purflings and things like that where you clamp everything together, maybe on a long straight edge or a long table. It's just more difficult. It just takes more time and effort, but you can do it. And if you're only doing a few pieces, that's what I'd recommend. But if you plan to do this, you know, more like a career or, um, you know, and do a lot of this, then I definitely highly, highly, highly recommend the vacuum pressing systems bag. And if you do go to either one of those places, please tell them Jerry sent you. Even if you're just making a comment or looking, you know, just please tell them I sent you. Uh, they both did right by me and uh, I have, am absolutely impressed with both products. And knowing what I know now, and I can say this honestly, and I again, I 
say this with my hand on the Bible, knowing what I know now, I would buy both of those products and, and save myself all the heartache and headache I've gone through over the years. I'll be honest, I never even really thought about them. Well, first of all, I didn't know about the AccuSlice until recently. And the vacuum thing, I, it was kind of a mystery to me. I didn't really know how it worked and all that stuff. So I didn't really know enough to go get those things. But I'm telling you, those are great products. Uh, this is not intended to be that commercial. I'm just trying to explain that, you know, if, if you decide you want to make your own bindings and purflings, those are two things that make it much easier. Um, let me see. You can also, and, and some people may not be aware of this, but you see how this is already pre-shaped? This is, again, a uh, herringbone pattern that I bought pre-shaped. So you can buy a lot of this stuff pre-shaped already. And uh, maybe from, maybe, I don't remember where I got this. I might have got it from LMI, which is Luthier's Mercantile. Or I might have got it from Stumac. Honestly, I don't remember. It was a long time ago. I've had, I had, a, I bought a whole bunch of these pieces. I'm down to the last few, but I bought a bunch of these years ago. Um, now I'd probably just make my own. But you know, back then I didn't know how. So um, one other thing I wanted to mention here, and I just brought this out. And again, I don't know which company I bought it from. I, I might have been Stumac, might have been Luthier. It might, this might have actually come from it, uh, International Luthier Supply, which was out of Oklahoma, which I don't even think exists anymore. Might, I think. Someone told me that there may still exist. I'm not really sure. But anyway, they're out of, they were out of Oklahoma. And this is just a piece of flexible uh, non-glueable plastic. And what this is, is kind of a placeholder. So let's say you're putting an outside binding on and you wanted to come back and put shell in between the binding and the top. Well, you would have already routed the trench wide enough, but maybe you put this in there to hold space for that shell that you're going to inlay in there later and the glue won't stick to this. So when you glue your binding on, this kind of becomes a placeholder and you, then you can just pull this out and now you're left with a perfectly fine trench around there that you can put your inlay in, your shell inlay or whatever. So this is something that you could at least consider. Uh, I don't even know if this stuff's still available. Truthfully, I haven't looked any of this up. I just know this is what I have and it does work. Um, let's see, the last thing or have I finished? I think I've kind of finished. Um, you know, uh, let me let me just talk briefly about applying the bindings to the instruments. There's two or three methods. Uh, you've seen me do both methods or two or three methods in my videos. I used to use what they call cloth binding tape, uh, and it's not got anything to do with this kind of binding. I think it's binding tape. I think they refer to it for making dressmakers and things. They they use it around the you know circumference of a dress tail or something anyway it's some kind of a fabric and i just tied a bunch of them together the reason i used that was i tie it you know i would uh, it doesn't um, leave any marks on your binding like if you're using plastic binding like if you tie it with string and you can use string and i have used string string could potentially leave a mark in your binding uh, but string works pretty well if you don't want to go to this extreme. But that, that binding tape, I just tied a bunch of it together to make a really long piece. And then you can wrap around your instrument and wrap your binding tight to the body. That actually is one of the best ways to do it. It really is. Uh, just on this guitar here, just uh, I used, uh, I've used two methods on this guitar. One of them is I used regular binding tape. Uh, when I say tape this time, I mean, you know, just regular tape like this. And you can get this from Stumac or some of the other uh, Luthier supply houses. And so I, you know, actually physically use this to tape it over there. Th at this point in my life, this is really hard on my hands. It hurts like you would not believe to pull this tight and, and try to put the binding on with this. So when I got around to the last couple of pieces, I actually used a, a large rubber band and or inner tube. I used both, actually I used both of those, now that I think about it. So I had a, a long rubber band that one of my wonderful viewers sent me. Um, 
for, uh, which I think was used on model airplanes for winding up a model airplane uh, propeller. Um, and really long rubber band though. And uh, I use that and I'll be honest with you, I'm not crazy about that because the rubber band stretches so much that it wants to roll and slide around the body. When you use what I did, what I actually liked the best, and even after considering that, that uh, long cloth binding tape that I was referring to to begin with, after using that and compared to using a long inner tube strand, the inner tube is the way to go. Uh, if you can find yourself an old car inner tube and start kind of in the where the center of the hole of the donut would be and you basically just start cutting and you just start cutting around and around and around and around and around and around and you try to keep your strips about um, this wide and it's just you just make it one continuous cut and you just keep going you don't ever cut it off and you just keep going and make it you know 50 feet long if you can then you can wrap that around your instrument and around the binding and it really does a nice job it wasn't nearly as hard on my hands doing that method um, so if you have trouble with your hands for sure that tape thing it, it's really hard on your hands it really is when i didn't have trouble with my hands it was not a problem but it is a problem now and uh so the so of all the methods right now my method of choice is to use the inner tube it really works good to attach your binding to your edges of your instrument and the inner tube is it's just the right combination of stretchiness with uh, tackiness if you will it kind of holds without sliding and stuff it really works good it really does and uh, uh, when I say the width, I'm going to say five eighths of an inch, not quite three quarters, somewhere in there. A little over a half inch wide, half inch and narrower, I think is too narrow. Um, so roughly about five eighths of an inch <laughs> to be that specific. Okay, I think I'm off of that one. Uh, I think I've covered about everything on binding and, and you know, purfling that I wanted to cover. Um, I'm ready to take questions, I think. I'm looking here just to see if I have missed anything on my uh, outline. I think I've covered everything today. And I think I've covered all my videos that I had here. Yeah, I believe I did. Okay, so let me go to the questions. Please be sure to put question marks in front of your questions so I can see them. We are already at nine o'clock, so I'm only gonna take two or three questions, and it looks like there's a bunch of them already in there. So, uh, John Telford says, do you heat or steam them to make the curves? Uh, very good question. Yes, I use my side bender that I built, and if you don't know what that is, the best place to check that out is on my website, rosastringworks.com, and I, at the top, there's some tabs at the top, and one of them is dedicated to the side bender, and um, it points you to the videos that you can watch and tell you all about how I built it. Um, and if you have specific questions after that, you can always email me or something. But yeah, John, that a uh, good question. But yeah, I use my side bender and I do sprit spritz it with water and then so basically it is kind of a steam thing because you're putting it on that hot metal and it and it bends it that way. Good question. Uh, why aren't guitar tops uneven in thickness when violins and mandolins are? Wouldn't it make them sound better? Well, you know, you've kind of got a point, and there are arch top instruments that are carved that way, arch top guitars. Um, but most of the voicing on a, on a flat top guitar, uh, you know, a dreadnought style guitar, is done with your bracing. So it's kind of the same thing, but just different. Uh, so, you know, you hit on a good point, but um, those boards, the, the spruce quarter sawn is pretty resonant in and of itself. Um, so by just voicing the bracing, you kind of accomplish the very same thing. And it's easier to do. So that's the reason I would say. Good question, but that's kind of the way I, that's the way I would interpret it anyway. Uh, let's see, going down through here, do we have other questions? We're going to take, I'm going to take maybe two more questions. Uh, Jerry, uh, looks like Jerry Schofield. 
What sealer would you recommend to use under true oil finish going on rosewood? Well, um, that's a good question, and I'm not a finish expert. I truly am not. I, I really just kind of want to make that point. Um, you don't have to put anything under it. Uh, the true oil itself will build up over time and it will be fine. As you may or may not know, uh, Jerry, I have tried tons of different uh, sealers and uh, fillers and etc. And I don't like any of them. And I mean, when I say I don't like them, I mean I kind of hate them all. I don't I haven't found one that I think is worth 15 cents. And that's the truth, because I've tried them all, and I've tried them according to the recommendations. I've actually talked to the presidents of several companies uh, and talked to them and, and got their recommendations and their people working with me, and all of it is crap, in my opinion. And that's just putting it as nice as I can put it. Um, you know, my point about it is, if I have to multiply put it on in multiple, multiple coats, sand it off, put it on again, and put, I might as well just do the finish and forget the rest of that crud because the rest of the crud doesn't do any better, in my opinion, than the finish does. Now, Paduke is exponentially tough, I will tell you. Paduke pores are huge. So that may be what you've seen me struggle with in the past too, but it, the Paduke is just tough. It really is. The rest of the woods aren't that tough, really. And to me, I don't think you need much grain filler on most of the rest of them. Okay, uh, beat that to death. Let's see. Um, one more question here. Clyde Lewis, shellac for some classical guitars normally takes a while to cure, but how can you tell if it's too old to use? Uh, well, Clyde, again, I'm not sure I'm the right guy for that answer. Um, maybe someone else can answer it. But to me, if it stirs and it pours and it looks reasonably clear, it's good to use. <laughs> I, I don't think it so much has, I mean, not everything has a shelf life. But I don't think it's so much the shelf life, how old it is, as to whether it looks clear and looks usable. I mean, honestly. And if it is, and it does, I'd say you go ahead and use it. That's my two cents worth, and again, I'm no expert on that. Don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you, Zappa. I appreciate that. Um, folks, I talked too much today. I'm sorry, but I did have a lot of content. I hope you enjoyed the miscellaneous stuff and the other miscellaneous recommendations and the public service announcements and so forth, etc. Hope you got something out of it. We'll be here same time, same place next Friday. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, yeah.